Mother Knows Death presents External Exams with Nicole and Jemmy. Hi, everyone. Welcome to Mother Knows Death. On this week's external exam, we will be talking with Matt Mangino, who is a former district attorney and author of The Executioner's Toll 2010. He's currently an adjunct professor at the Thiel College and writes a weekly syndicated column on crime and punishment that is published in major newspapers, including The Washington Post and The Philadelphia Inquirer. Matt has also been featured on major news outlets, including CNN, MSNBC, Fox, as a legal commentator, and is a regular contributor to Crime Stories with Nancy Grace and Court TV. Hi, Matt. Welcome to Mother Knows Death. Thanks for being here today. Well, it's great. Uh, thanks for having me. I first met Matt at CrimeCon. Actually, you were the first person that I met on the elevator as soon as I was going down for the first time, and I never... I didn't really know who you were, so I met you and you were really friendly, so that was super cool. And then when I started looking into what you were doing and everything, I was like, oh, this guy's awesome. I'm going to have him on the show. Yeah, well, it's, it's a pleasure to be here. So at CrimeCon, you did a lecture called Through the Lens of an Auteur, How Five Classic Hollywood Films Influenced the Justice System. Can you tell us a little bit about that lecture? Yeah, sure. It, w w it was um, it was something that um, I've been interested in. I'm kind of a a, a movie buff, and um, as you know, the crime con is just you, know, you have so many uh, people there who are interested in true crime and, and other issues. And then on the other side of the coin, you have um, you know the classic movie fans. Uh, you know the people who follow. Turner classic movies and, and, and they're just as energized as the true crime people. So I thought, you know, it'd be interesting to kind of join those, uh, two together. And, uh, really there, there was five movies that I looked at that, um, I thought, you know, had an impact on how we view and understand the criminal justice system. And really the, those five movies were, uh, you know, from a, a very short period of time, 1957 to, to 1962. And um, what was fascinating about these movies is that they, they had great actors, um, you know, outstanding directors, uh, all the movies won, uh, you know, uh, Academy Awards, depending on, on, you know, what aspect uh, of the movie, uh, you know, so... You know, and, and, and people who are familiar with with sort of true crime and, and familiar with movies will, will recognize these movies, you know, Anatomy of a Murder and, uh, you know, uh, the Judgment at Nuremberg and uh, Twelve Angry Men and Witness for the Prosecution and, of course, uh, To Kill a Mockingbird. And so, um, you know, what, what I sort of did was examine... Uh, you know, through cri uh, clips and, and through the legal process, you know, what was, you know, realistic about these movies and, you know, what just wouldn't happen in, in a real courtroom. Uh, I, I thoroughly enjoyed preparing for it and I, I really enjoyed uh, presenting it. It's a really interesting perspective, actually, because back then when those films were, move were made, there was no real true crime shows right so it was all every exposure that all of the regular people had to that was just through the eyes of filmmakers so that's interesting as opposed to now that there's just so much of this real true crime stuff out there right so so if you if you wanted to to see what it was like in a courtroom um the only place that you you had an opportunity to do that was down at your county courthouse if if you wanted to go down and actually watch a, a live trial which you know in in um you know the late 19th century and the early 20th century was sort of like entertainment uh you know it was tough to get into a courtroom to, to watch a trial because people would go down there uh, to watch it because that was kind of like entertainment in, in in the community um you know the thing that that i thought was interesting is is that these 
movies uh, really shaped what people thought courtrooms were like. And, and as you said, you know, that was the only place they could go. Now, you know, of course, television came around and, and, and you had, you know, shows like Perry Mason and, and, and uh, things like that, which, you know, you know, shaped our perspective of the uh, criminal justice system as well. But, it, but really, those were the only places that, that you could you could see uh, a trial. Yeah, I rem- so so wait, I have a question. Are you, can mm-hmm. you still go can regular people just go watch trials now? Oh yes. I mean, you know, that's kind of one of the um hallmarks of of the criminal justice system or or the uh justice system period is that it's open to the public. You know, we don't do things in the criminal justice system where people can't see what's going on. So so you know, really every hearing, every trial is open to the public and anybody can come in there and watch it. Now, there are some, sometimes there are sensitive uh, issues that over time, you know, we've thought were not appropriate, like children testifying and, and, and things like that. Sometimes the courtroom could be closed, but that's, that's not the rule. I mean, you know, all proceedings are open and people have an opportunity to come in and watch. Them. That's that's actually awesome to hear because I always see people that are reporters and stuff that were they say, oh, we were sitting and watching the trial and I thought you had to, some special press pass or something to get in there. I didn't know you could just go do that, but I, I might do some of that because it, yeah. it sounds cool. I went, when I was uh, doing my internship at the medical examiner's office, I went to court a couple times with the ME when they had to testify, and I just thought it was yeah. so cool just to, it was like watching real life law and order or something. It was really neat. Yeah. So did you, yeah, it is. did you, um, was this the first time you went to CrimeCon or, or you've been there before? No, actually I, I'd been there before. Uh, I was there in, um, what would it on uh, 2022 and actually presented on my book, uh, The Executioner's Toll. So um, uh, I, I, this was my, I'm a, I'm a veteran. <laughs> I'm a prime con veteran. All right. That let's, we have to talk about your book because I, I love the whole idea of it. It's just really cool. So the book is called, like you just said, The Executioner's Toll 2010. And it gives a detailed examination of every execution that was carried out in a single year in America. So it chronicles 63 murders, 44 trials, countless appeals, two suicide attempts, 41 last meals, 33 final statements, and 46 executions. So rather than talking about death penalty cases that have happened in America throughout history, you chose to cover executions that happened in one specific year of 2010. Why did you choose to write this book in the first place, and why did you choose to do it in this way? Well, uh, you know, first off, I've I've been interested in the death penalty. Um, you know, I was a prosecutor uh, for eight years. I tried death penalty cases. Um, as a defense attorney, I've tried first degree murder cases. So, so I've seen the system uh, from both sides, and. Uh, you know, the, the death penalty has always fascinated me uh, because, you know, I think with the death penalty, a lot of what we know and understand about the law has kind of grown out of that. And, and you know, we can um, elaborate that on, on that in the moment. But but the reason I, I, I chose to write the book the way that I did is that that most of the time when you're when you're dealing with the death penalty or someone's writing about it or it's a book about the death penalty. People write from a certain bias. So, so they either support the death penalty or they're opposed to the death penalty. So what they do is they cherry pick the best cases over time that support their position. And so what I thought I would do is instead of you know cherry pick these cases, what I would do is, is pick one year and look at every execution in that single year. Look at the, the crimes uh, look at the investigations, look at the trials, the appeals, you know, everything, as you said, down to the, to the last mill. And so in this 46 cases, you're going to get cases that say 
hey, you know, this case cries out for the death penalty. And then you're going to get cases where you say, why? Wow, why did this guy get executed and not one of the other 2,500 people on death row? So what I thought it would, would do is get people to think and, and say, hey, uh, you know, read this book, look at these cases, and you decide whether you think uh, the death penalty is an appropriate you know, punishment in America's criminal justice system. I love that because, yeah, like you were saying, you don't want to read something because I, I really go back and forth with it. I used to be 100% and in on my website, The Gross Room, we'll read about cases of people that do these horrible crimes and you could see the photos from the crime scene. So it really gives you a representation of how horrible it was. And then you hear that these people are are on death row or get the death penalty. And we have comments in the section of people saying why why they're against it because I've always been like so pro death penalty and then I'm kind of think hmm all right I could see your point there and then it's better to always get both sides of everything so you could really make your own decision so since I don't really know if this is something that you want to like state for the record but it is a very controversial thing to say that you're pro death penalty or not but I think with your experience of being both a prosecutor and defense attorney, you you've seen both sides of it. What are you, are you pro death penalty or are you do you think it should we shouldn't use it? Well, you know, my opinion is, you know, right now uh, the death penalty is broken. Uh, I, I don't think that it works uh, for any uh, appropriate um uh, means uh, of punishment. So when we talk about punishment in this country, we look at it from a couple of different perspectives. So, so we look at it, you know, obviously there's a punitive aspect to, to punishment in this country. There's a uh, deterrence factor to punishment in this country. Uh, there's a, a, a retribution factor uh, and there's a rehabilitation factor. And I don't think that the death penalty provides any of those uh, to the criminal justice system right now. So so just to give you an example, um, you know, in the last few years, there have been on average, of course, COVID had an impact, but there's been on average of maybe about 20 to 25 executions a year. Okay. And, and actually um, on my blog, uh, mattmangino.com, I write about every execution and have for the last 10 years. So you can really go through there and, and look at every one. But, but um, you know, there, there are 2,000 or more people on death row. Uh, you know, so how is it that, you know, we select 20 people or 25 people a year out of 2,000 uh, to be executed? Uh, you know, so... so in, you know, in 1972, the uh, United States Supreme Court said that the death penalty was arbitrary in the way that it was um, imposed. OK, there was no sort of guidelines about who would get the death, who, who would be tried uh, under a death penalty case, who would be executed. There was it was it was arbitrary. So so the United States Supreme Court struck down the death penalty. didn't say that the death penalty was unconstitutional but just said that it was arbitrary in the way that it was being I imposed. Um, so, you know, states went back and they corrected that, so to speak. And, and now the death penalty, you know, in, in 1976 was supposed to be for the worst of the worst. And there were some guidelines, but now I think it's, it's arbitrary in the way that it's imposed um, or, or, or the way that it's carried out, excuse me. You know, again, how do you get to this point where you have all these people on death row? It's predominantly a, a you know, south of the Mason-Dixon line punishment. There aren't many states in the north who are who even have a death penalty anymore or who are carrying out the death penalty. Look at my state, state of Pennsylvania. You know, we've had the death penalty since 1976, the modern era of the death penalty. And we've executed three people. And all three of those people volunteered to be executed. They, they gave up their appeal rights and, and just wanted to be executed. The last time we involuntarily executed somebody in Pennsylvania 
was 1962. Yet we still have it on the books and we still impose it, uh, but we don't carry it out. So, so, so my answer in that sort of long convoluted uh, statement is that I don't think the death penalty works. Um, there are certainly some people that I think the only option is the death penalty. And there, there was a case like that in 2010 that I wrote about, but you know, the, the, the means by which we carry it out is arbitrary and capricious and therefore doesn't work. Do you think it, cause obviously right now I think it's not a deterrent at all because if you just know, like you're just saying that if you, how many people get murdered in the United States a year and then how many are actually executed, it's, it's like, you'll take the risk, right? <laughs> because the chances right. of that happening to you are, are 0.1% probably. But do you think if it was actually carried out in such a way that you, you had a timely trial and you were put to death shortly afterwards that, and, and a lot, most people were, that it would be more of a deterrent? Well, yeah, I, I think um, that you're exactly right. Uh, there, there has to be, you know, people have to see the consequences of their conduct for it to be a deterrent. Um, and, and so, you know, the only way that you could do that would be uh, if you had uh, a trial and then you had a timely uh, review process and ultimately an execution. You know, right now, um, the average stay on death row is more than 20 years. Okay. And most of those people who go off of death row don't go off by means of execution. They die of natural causes and other things. I mean, uh, you know, when you think about the number of people on death row and the number of executions um, per year, you, you, you know, see that you know, that this process, uh, as it exists right now is, is arbitrary. Yeah. The other thing that I, that, that that's a, a sure sign that, that the death penalty is, is waning in this country. And that is the number of, uh, death penalty verdicts that there are, there, there are, that the number has dramatically fallen, uh, over the last 10 years, uh, in terms of the number of people that are being sentenced to death, uh, you know, by a jury. So, so there, there's no question that, that the death penalty is, is sort of, you know, spiraling, you know, downward, uh, but there still are states, pred uh, predominantly Southern states who are using the death penalty, but certainly not as prolific as they have in the past. Why do you think that is? Is that because that the prosecutors aren't putting death penalty on the table or the jury isn't, isn't convicting people of, for the death penalty. Well, I think that, that, uh, fewer prosecutors are seeking the death penalty in cases. Um, and fewer, uh, fewer juries are, um, uh, imposing the death penalty. And, and so I think it's a matter of both. Uh, and there are so many things that, that are considered in that process. And, you know, number one, for a lot of communities, uh, across the country, it's the cost. Um, you know, if you, if you're in a, in a small County, uh, you know, a rural County and, um, you're going to seek the death penalty, uh, you know, think about the costs that are going to be involved. You're, you know, you're, so you're going to have. You know, prosecutors are going to have to dedicate their time to this case. More than likely, the defense is going to be paid for by the state uh, or the state and the county. Um, there are going to be expert witnesses. They're going to be mitigation experts. And then ultimately, if there is a, a death penalty conviction or, or even a, a first degree murder life in prison conviction, you're going to have appeals and those appeals are going to continue, uh, you know, for years. Uh, it, it doesn't matter. You know, people say, well, you know, if we got rid of the death penalty, we wouldn't have as many appeals. Well, I don't really agree with that. Uh, you know, somebody who's been convicted of 
first degree murder and sentenced to life in prison, guess what? They're not going to say, oh, oh boy, I'm happy I didn't get the death penalty. So I'm just going to sit here and twiddle my thumbs in prison, you know, for the next 50 years. No, they're going to, they're going to appeal their, their first degree uh, murder conviction. So, so, you know, whenever a case, you know, a, 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 a um, sort of catastrophic case, whether it's, you know, multiple homicides or a homicide in, in, in a small community, it costs taxpayers and, and county government huge sums of money. It has an impact literally on on the services in, in a particular community. Does So everyone, once they're convicted of something like this, they have the right to appeal, but is there a limit on how many times they can do that? Well, uh, you know, in a way there is. So, you know, let's look at Pennsylvania, for instance, okay, where I, where I practice. If you're convicted of um, first degree murder and, and sentenced to death, you have an automatic uh, appeal right to the Supreme Court of Pennsylvania, okay? You know, normally we have inter intermediary courts, the Superior Court and the Commonwealth Court, where you would first appeal. But because it's a it's it's a first degree uh, murder death penalty, you have an automatic right to go straight to the Supreme Court. So so you know the Supreme Court will review that. The Supreme Court of Pennsylvania, you have the right to appeal that. You you know even to the Supreme Court um, of the United States. But after your direct appeal rights are exhausted, well, so let's say the Supreme Court uh, affirms your uh, your conviction or con confirms the uh, conviction, and you know the United States Supreme Court says we're not going to hear this case. You then have, um, you know, collateral opportunities to appeal. Okay, so in Pennsylvania we have post conviction right, uh, rights, which means that. After your appeal's over, you can now appeal other issues through this post-conviction process. Like you could allege that your attorney failed you, that he or she was ineffective, and that's a whole new issue that, that goes through the process. So, so you know, the trial court will will um, entertain your post-conviction. Then you you know you have an opportunity to appeal that to the superior court, to the Pennsylvania Supreme Court. Then after those issues have all been exhausted, you have a right to file what are called habeas corpus petitions in the federal court saying that you're being held unlawfully because of this, this, and this. So yes, appeal rights can go on and on and on. And then, you know, you can seek, uh, you know, the Supreme Court of the United States, uh, you know, seek their uh, ability to postpone an execution or, or, you know, other things you can look at, at pardons, asking the governor to, to uh, rescind your death penalty, uh, sentence. So, so yeah, yeah. I mean, they do go on and on and there's, there's last minute appeals, you know, right up until the point that people are executed. So yeah, there's a great deal of, um, expense and, uh, you know, man and woman power that goes into working on these cases. And what what are the parameters for getting the death penalty verdict? Because you were saying earlier about how in your state there's these specific rules, and I live in New Jersey, which I don't mm -hmm. even know if we have the death penalty. Honestly, no, I don't. I don't think you do. I don't think New Jersey has the death penalty. New York doesn't have the death penalty. What what so. state what state has the most? I guess severe laws as it comes to the death penalty and actually carries them out. Is well, uh, the most prolific uh, state in terms of executions is Texas. Um, it, Texas consistently has had um, the most uh, executions uh, year in and year out. Uh, obviously, you know, it's a large state, um, but, but they've been very uh, prolific in terms of carrying out executions and imposing death penalties. But even Texas has, has experienced a dramatic decline in death penalty uh, verdicts. Uh, but, you know, uh, they, they are the leading state by far in terms of executions. Is So I guess my question is, 
there's so many people that get murdered every single day. We hear we hear about it. What what makes a person? It, what what are the rules as far as giving someone the death penalty? Because usually it's like, oh, if you, I don't know, if you shoot someone in a robbery in a bodega, I don't hear about those kinds of people. But it seems mm-hmm. like it's more horrific crimes, maybe. Or has there ever yeah. been a case where someone, is it specific to murder or can it be for other things like child rape or molestation or something like that? Well, you know, there was, uh, I'll answer your last question first, because it's a great question. Uh, so, so there was a time where, um, you know, rape was a capital offense. So, so you could be sentenced to death for rape. Uh, as you can imagine, uh, that was uh, particularly important, again, in Southern states uh, where there were uh, allegations um you know, that a black man raped a white woman. So, so there were a lot. And if you think back, um, you know, we talked earlier about movies, uh, To Kill a Mockingbird, that's what To Kill a Mockingbird is about. That, that's what the, uh, the book, um, Harper Lee's Pulitzer Prize winning book, and ultimately the, the movie was about a black man who was accused of raping a white woman. Um, and, and so, Yes. Yeah, so, so there, there were times in which there were more, more than just murder could be punished by the death penalty that changed. Um, and, and, you know, then there, there was, uh, issues recently, I, I say within the last 10 years in which, uh, Louisiana, for instance, uh, added to, to the death penalty, the rape of a child. If, if you were convicted of the rape of a child, you could receive the death penalty. Finally, the Supreme court of the United States said that the death penalty can only be imposed for the, for, for murder. For, there has to be a loss of life, uh, for the death penalty, uh, to be imposed. Uh, but you know, it's interesting that that hasn't stopped states from continuing to enact laws that say, like, for instance, the rape of a child, Florida has a law that says the rape of a child, uh, could result in a death penalty. That's, that's not going to happen. I mean, happen. I don't, I don't have, see, when you say loss of a life, I think like if you rape a child, you're kind of taking away their life in a way, you know, they're physically not dead, but you kind of ruin their life in a certain way. So yeah. it could be argued that <laughs> that is a loss yeah. of a life, I would say. No, I, I understand. Uh, but, but, you know, the right now, the way it exists, the Supreme Court has said that there has to be death okay but you know other states are, are continuing to challenge that so so florida enacts the, the child rape law again you know maybe it goes back to the supreme court and we have uh we have we have seen where the supreme court uh doesn't have a problem with overruling precedent so uh you know that that could be the law in the future again uh but but uh the bottom line is as it exists right now if you commit first degree murder, which means you, you know, planned premeditated murder. Okay. You can be subject to the death penalty if there are certain additional aggravating factors. And when I spoke earlier about the Supreme court overturning the death penalty, and then it, then it coming back, that's how it came back. It came back with these new laws that said that not only do you have to commit first degree murder? There has to be aggravating circumstances as well. And those aggravating fir- circumstances could be the death of a child. Um, it could be murdering a police officer, murdering a pregnant woman, murdering a witness who's going to testify against you. And then, you know, states have sort of added on to that. You know, if it was a horrific murder, I mean, I don't know how you differentiate differentiate between what's horrific and what isn't if somebody's murdered but but those circumstances have to be found the defendant can also present during the penalty phase of a trial after you've been convicted when they determine life or death a defendant can present mitigating factors you know why uh they shouldn't be punished with the most harsh punishment 
uh, that exists. But but that's how you know the death penalty has evolved to to kind of make it more specific to um, um, you know the worst of the worst. Does it really work that way? I I don't think that it does because I think states have enacted sort of catch all uh, aggravating factors that really just about any first degree murder case could still end up a death penalty case in some states, but that's how the process works. So in the past couple of years, we've had some really high profile cases where the the person was given the death penalty and it was overturned. So Mm -hmm. first, uh, obviously a big one on this show is Scott Peterson, who was accused of killing his wife and unborn child. Um, He was given the death penalty originally, and then that got overturned in 2020. And then just in the past couple of weeks on the news, the the 9-11 mastermind, Khalid Sheikh Mohammed, he was had the death penalty, which I think that most Americans were completely okay with. And then we heard that he did some kind of a plea deal and his death penalty got overturned, which was was shocking. But then we saw that the defense secretary revoked that plea deal, I guess. Can you can you explain what happened in these cases th- mm-hmm. and how often the death penalty gets revoked? Well, the death penalty uh, gets overturned, um, you know, frequently. So, so, so some people will, will say that, you know, people who are convicted um, and sentenced to death have sort of a, a super due process. So due process means you get the right to be heard and, and the right to have your case uh, reviewed and, and present whatever you uh, think is important in your own defense. Some suggest that people sentenced to death have a super due process. The court really examines uh, these cases maybe even more closely than other uh, appeals uh, because so much is at stake. You know, we know that people who have been on death row, not a lot of them, but people who have been on death row have been exonerated. Uh, you know, which means they're, they're not only was their conviction overturned, they've been found to be innocent, um, but they spent time on death row. So, so the courts are particularly concerned about um, and cautious about someone who's sentenced to death because, you know, once you're executed, uh, there's no one doing that, you know, so you could sit in jail for 25 years and that's a terrible thing. And then ultimately be exonerated. You lost those 25 years, but you're still a lot. Uh, if you, if you've been executed and all of a sudden someone says, Oh, wait, we made a mistake here. And there really isn't anything that says that we have executed an innocent person in this country in the modern era of, of the death penalty. Now there, there are cases in which people make, uh, you know, powerful arguments that an innocent person get executed, but there's no case that anybody can point to where there is, you know, DNA evidence that exonerates someone who was executed, uh, in this country. Um, but, you know, to go back to, to your questions, uh, you know, Scott Peterson, uh, for instance, uh, you know, he was sentenced to death and then ultimately his death penalty sentence, not his conviction, but his death penalty sentence was overturned because um, the courts found that there was some problem in the way that the jurors were uh, bordered in terms of the death penalty. So in order to be on a death penalty jury, you have to be death qualified, which means you have to be willing to say, I could impose the death penalty if the evidence in the law supports that. Okay. If you can't say that when you're being interviewed to be on the jury, then you can't be on the jury. Because if you, if you say I could never impose the death penalty, then we automatically know if you get on this jury, he's not going to get the death penalty. So, so jurors have to be death qualified. And what the, the, the court uh, said was that in Peterson's case, people were left off the jury who during their interview process or when they filled out their interview questionnaires, they did essentially say, I'm opposed to the death penalty, but I could impose it 
if if the law required me to do so. Because those people were arbitrarily eliminated from the pool, the court said that his death penalty had to be overturned. So he's still serving, you know, life in prison on first degree murder. But, you know, the Innocence Project is now involved in this case because they're suggesting, which is, you know, something because they normally only get involved in cases in which they uh, firmly believe uh, that someone has been falsely accused and they're involved in his case uh, and, and, and looking at it as well. With regard to um, the 9-11 um, terrorist, Muhammad, um, that's a little bit different. Uh, because they, they are, they, this plea was not made in a, you know, state or federal criminal court case. As I understand it, this is a military tribunal and this plea agreement was reached for, for life in prison, but ultimately the, the secretary of defense had the opportunity to give it a thumbs up or a thumbs down. And in this case, uh, they, they rescinded, uh, the plea, uh, it, 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 that's just, that's just a whole different process than, than, um, you know, the process in the Peterson case. See the, the Scott Peterson case is is kind of interesting to me because I, and, and a lot of my, uh, listeners here might get mad at me for saying this, but they don't, I, I, I don't really, I don't think he's innocent just by the way he was acting and everything. But I also think that to give someone like that the death penalty without having actual concrete evidence as like you were just talking about DNA and mm -hmm. just, or, you know, video or some kind of thing that, that directly links this murder to him. I, it does make me, it would make me a little nervous to say that because uh, I feel like most of his conviction was based on circumstantial evidence and not actually anything that proved that he actually killed her. You know what I mean? Yeah. And I see why they're, they're trying to see if someone else did it. You know what I mean? Because they don't have that evidence. So I get that. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, you know, the, the, the thing about, you know, Peterson, in, in most cases in this country, uh, you know, we, we've grown accustomed, you know, whether we, you know, it's trials that we're watching, you know, on court TV or law and crime or, or you know, maybe it's, uh, uh, you know, something that we're watching on television. You, you know, you, you get this idea that, you know, every case uh, has DNA or every case has, uh, you know, some sort of physical evidence, a fingerprint or, or, you know, uh, tool markings or whatever the, whatever it might be. But actually most cases don't, uh, most cases don't have any type of forensic evidence. You know, what you might have is, as a, as an eyewitness or, or what you might have is circumstantial evidence. And you can prove a case beyond a reasonable doubt with circumstantial evidence. It makes people feel uncomfortable, but, but, it, but, you know, this whole idea of the CSI effect, uh, and, and what that means is that people who watch television dramas and things like that, they have an unrealist, unrealistic expectation of what the state has in terms of evidence. Everybody expects DNA. Everybody expects fingerprints. Everybody ex accepts, uh, expects, you know, hair samples or fiber samples, and they just don't exist in most cases. Uh, and so it's made prosecutors' jobs much more difficult because often now what happens is prosecutors not only have to prove and present the evidence that they do have, they have to provide an explanation for why they don't have other evidence. And that's a, a, a new phenomenon that's developed because of, of this whole idea uh, and whole sort of focus on true crime and crime dramas on television. Yeah, it's interesting because when I was at the medical examiner's office, you know, as a student and not really knowing anything and seeing labs and everything for the first time, 
you you know, th- th- there was one person that they thought might have gotten like smothered by a pillow or something. And I'm like, are you guys going to collect fiber evidence? And they're like, we don't have the resources for that kind of stuff, you know? Um, yeah. And then you kind of got like a real picture of everything on those TV shows. It's just like most offices don't have these high end morgues with all of these different equipment things and the, right. the ability. I saw this. This one that they, um, I don't know if it was CSI or one of those types of shows, but they were pouring like silicone into knife molds and everything to see what weapon was used. And I was like, that, yeah, that's, I don't, that's kind of a stretch there. I'm sh- maybe they do it in some places, but certainly not any of the places that I did my rotations. Um, <laughs> In the book, you said that there are there were two inmates that attempted to kill themselves while they were on death row. Is is suicide a common thing that that these types of inmates try to do? Well, I mean, I, in my research, at least uh, in the the cases that I examined, um, as you said, there there were a couple of instances where where inmates um, attempted suicide and in. in and really, when you think about think about that, it, it it's not um, it's not funny, certainly, but but it's so ironic. So here's here's a guy, uh, an inmate, who attempts suicide. He's on death row, and so what you do is you doctor him back to health so that you can execute him. Um, I mean. It's so weird. It's just yeah, weird. It is. I mean, right. And, and, and so, yeah. So, so, um, you know, it's not uncommon, uh, you know, for, you know, people who are facing execution, um, you know, to, to try to take their own life and listen, you know, people who have been sentenced to life in prison without the possibility of parole or even people, um, unfortunately who have, you know, mental health problems, um, you know, suicide is not uncommon in local jails and prisons across the country, uh, regardless of your sentence. And that's, that's sad, uh, but true, unfortunately. Yeah. I was thinking like, why don't, why don't you just let them do it and like save a bunch of money in all of these appeals and just feeding them every day. If they want to die, just, I don't know. It, it is, it's, it is the weirdest thing ever. It's like this control thing, like, I, you know, I'm going to kill myself before I let them kill me. And then on the other side, it's like, no, we said we were killing you. You don't have control over this. Right. Um, right. And if you if you think, I mean, the most famous instance of that uh, was uh, Herman Goering, who uh, was a, a Nazi war criminal uh, who, uh, you know, they they watched those uh, war criminals around the clock so that they weren't. Uh, so they couldn't commit suicide before they were executed, but he was able uh, to get a cyanide uh, capsule and, and uh, commit suicide before his execution. So it's when you when you think about those things, it, it's just uh, bizarre, illogical, but that's the way it is. Yeah, I mean, I could understand like in the Jeffrey Epstein case that they didn't want him to kill himself because they need they were trying to get more information off of him. But at this point, if these people are just kind of sitting around and they're not trying to get any information and they want to die, like I, I don't see a problem with it. Yeah, um. So you followed 46 different people who were executed in, in your book. What are some of the worst crimes those people committed did you feel that their death penalty was justified well yeah I mean, so so one example of that is a guy named john uh uh let me see uh, i have my book right here and he, he was the last person executed john david duty he was from oklahoma and what he was he was in prison um serving a life sentence um because of some other crimes that he committed, he he was a habitual uh, offender, uh, um, you know, heinous crimes, rape and and other things. So he ultimately was sentenced to life in prison, and he didn't want to spend any more. He didn't want to spend his life in prison. So as we were talking about, instead of taking his own life, what he did was he 
set up a scheme with his cellmate where he would, where he said, listen, if, if, if you let me tie you up and, and, uh, you know, say that I'm harming you, they'll split us up and you'll have your own cell and I'll have my own cell. And what he ultimately does is restrain this guy, ties him up, and then strangles him to death. Oh, okay. my God. Then he sits down and writes a letter to this inmate's mother, essentially saying, I killed your son. He, it was, he wasn't worth anything, and he's better off dead. And, and, th and then he's going to send that uh, letter off to his mother while, while he's laying there dead. Ultimately... Um, John Dave D uh, Duty said, if you don't give me the death penalty, I'm going to continue to kill. Okay. I'm going to continue to kill. And whether it's other, another inmate or it's a guard, I'm going to kill until you give me the death. Penalty. Wow. And, and so, you know, there's, there's a guy, what do you do with someone like that? You know, I know it's scary because the guards are probably yeah. scared of that too. Right. I mean, you know, he, there's no way that he's not going to have any contact with another human being for the rest of his life sentence. I mean, so, so by letting this person continue to exist, you're putting other innocent people, whether they're inmates or whether they're, they're guards or other staff, you're putting them at risk. So, you know, the death penalty to me is really the only alternative. Um, you know, so, so, you know, that, that's what makes the death penalty so difficult. Yeah. You know, so, so here's another example of, of, of why the death penalty is, is so difficult, uh, to, to, for people to really grasp the nuances of it. So, you know, typically if you know somebody who's been murdered, um, you know, you tend to favor their execution, especially if it's a, a horrible crime a child or, or torture or something like that, you know, your, your ideas with regard to the death penalty, you know, become very supportive of, of death. And so it's hard to, to do that because that's, you know, to understand that because that's sort of localized, you know what I mean? So the best two examples we have of that on a wider basis is, um, number, uh, number one, a uh, Saddam Hussein. So when he was um, sentenced to death, okay, there was support uh, for the death penalty among the, the, the country at about 61%, okay? When, the, when, the, when the, those people were polled, when we were polled about Saddam Hussein, uh, Hussein's death penalty, that number went up to like 82%. So 82% of people supported the death penalty for Saddam Hussein but only 61% of people supported the death penalty generally. So that meant 20% of people who don't support the death penalty supported it for him because they knew of his crimes. The same thing with, with the Oklahoma City bomber. It's very similar. So, so the death penalty support was at like 63% uh, support for the death penalty uh, for that specific defendant went up to like 83%. So, so it's inconsistent. I mean, people don't even understand themselves. Oh, I don't support the death penalty, but I do support it for Saddam Hussein, or I do support it for the Oklahoma city bomber. Um, you know, it creates, you know, sort of, a, a dilemma within individuals themselves, um, whether or not they support the death penalty and why they support it the death. But so, so that's an example of someone, uh, you know, uh, who deserves the death penalty. I don't, I don't see the alternative, but then you look at it at, at another case, um, in, in the book, uh, Martin Grossman and Martin Grossman had a conviction. Uh, and he, he was on, um, probation. He wasn't allowed to, uh, carry a firearm with him. Or, or to possess a firearm. And so he's out with his buddy, you know, in the woods and they're shooting a gun target practice. And it just so happens that a Florida game warden, a woman pulls up and she asks them who they are. And, and, and he realizes now that he's on 
probation and he's going to have a probation violation because he's out shooting a gun and uh, he's going to go back to jail and he doesn't want to go back to jail. So a struggle ensues uh, between him and the game warden when she, when she wants to, uh, you know, arrest him. And ultimately he gets her gun uh, during this struggle and, and she shot and killed. Um, you know, that that's, you know, the, it's questionable whether or not that is even first degree murder. Okay. Um, you know, because it, it wasn't something that was planned and premeditated, although y- y- you can premeditate something in seconds, but this is, this is more like, you know, a third degree murder, right? You know, death, uh, y- you know, not necessarily by accident, but with malice, um, you know, not with the intent necessarily to kill, but ultimately he got convicted of first degree murder, sentenced to death and he was executed. Um, you know, so, so, you know, that's really, you know, one extreme, you know, to another, uh, you know, in, in 2010 with regard to the death penalty. So, so that's what I think, you know, makes this book, uh, make people think, you know, you, you know, critically think through the process and whether or not, you know, you support, uh, the death penalty or whether or not you can, you can take, you know, a, an unwavering position with regard to that, the death penalty either way. In 2010, what was the most common method used for execution? I know they're, they vary mm-hmm. state by state, but what was the most common one in that particular year? Yeah. So, so what was interesting about 2010 is the, the predominant method of execution in this country is lethal injection. So, so that is by and far used by most every state. And, and it's the, the number one form of execution in most every state that has death penalty. But in 2010, there was an execution by electric chair in Virginia. And the reason that it was able to be done was because you could select in Virginia what type of execution you wanted if it was legal and being used when you were convicted. So this guy had been on death row for so long that when he was convicted, the electric chair was still an option in Virginia. And because it was still an option when he was convicted, 25 years later, he could he could still ask for that. And he was executed by electric chair. The other um, one was, which is extremely rare, was firing squad. In Utah, you can still, and now there's other states uh, since, but you could still um, select firing squad as your method of execution. And, and it really has to do with the Mormon religion. And I, you know, there's some uh, atonement if you bleed out, uh, you know, in, in seeking forgiveness. And so uh, there was someone who was executed by a firing squad uh, in Utah. And, and the other interesting thing is the first execution that occurred in this country after the death penalty was reinstated in 1976 was Gary Gilmore, who was executed by a firing squad uh, in Utah. So other states now have adopted, I think Oklahoma uh, and, and others are have adopted executions as a, a method of execution if lethal um, injection drugs are not available. See, I've done examinations on all these forms of capital punishment as far as this goes. And honestly, just based on what I know from anatomy and physiology, I would pick firing squad over any of these because the lethal injection is it, it could you can stay alive for a while after you get it. There's actually been cases of it that it has failed and the person didn't die. But you can get pulmonary edema, which is getting fluid in your lungs. And it I, I feel like that would just be the most terrible, excruciating death. At least with the firing squad, it's like it gets the job done and it's quick. I, I feel like you wouldn't even feel it. It just would be over, you know? Right. It no, sounds I, I, silly no. to say that, but honestly... No. <laughs> 
Well, you're right. Uh, and, 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 uh, that's exactly, um, Right, because there there have been studies. I know there was a professor, uh, Deborah Deno, who who did a study on on different methods of execution and concluded, uh, just as you have, is that the death penalty. I mean, that the uh, firing squad is by far the most humane and um, you know the best method for carrying out the death penalty because death is a- almost instantaneous. Um, you know, you're shot in the heart, your heart stops beating and, and you're dead in seconds. Um, but it's, it, but it doesn't look good. Okay. And, and that's what, that's what people want that, you know, that's what lethal injection is all about. It's not only supposed to be, you know, humane way of, ki- of killing somebody, you know, you put these lethal drugs in their system, but you know, they also put in, or, or they have in the past, they put in a, a paralytic, which stops you your body from gyrating or anything like that, which doesn't look good. And, and, um, you know, the, that's the only reason that paralytic is part of the lethal injection, uh, mixture is so people who are observing the death penalty, uh, on that day, the execution aren't uncomfortable with unsightly things that might happen with your body. It's, it's crazy. It really is. It just annoys the shit out of me, honestly. Yeah. So let's talk about something a little fun. Um, okay. you, in the book, you covered that there there were 41 last meals. And mm-hmm. um, I don't know if you know this, but there's this guy. I covered this like uh, uh, within the year. There's this guy on Instagram that gets a, a list of what everyone's last meal was. And then he cooks the meal and he rates it, which I just <laughs> think is kind of like an interesting thing. Did you... What are some of, did you get to hear what some of the last meals people chose and does, are there people, cause it looks like there was 46 inmates, but there was only 41 last meal. So are there some people that are just like, I, I don't care. I don't, I don't want to participate in this kind of. Yeah. I mean, there, there uh, are people who don't want to last meal. Um, you know, there, there, I guess. You know, for some, there's religious reasons, you know, why they don't eat, you know, immediately before their execution, um, you know, that, that I've read about, but then, you know, there are others who, you know, they order, you know, uh, milkshakes and pints of ice cream and, uh, you know, uh, Dr. Pepper seemed to be, um, something that, that people were interested in getting, you know bottles of uh dr pepper and and you know some of them are very extravagant and and so what 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 i've as i understand it you know some states set um uh limits you know like your meal can can cost 25 dollars or whatever the interesting thing that that texas did and they used to have elaborate uh last meals uh, was that they said, well, you know, we're not going to do that anymore. So whatever, every other inmates eating on that day, that's what you, that's what you get for your, for your meal. And, and as I said, Texas, uh, carries out, uh, more executions by far than, than any other state. But, um, yeah, you know, I guess, you know, I've, uh, when I looked at some of these, you know, they, they want an apple pie or they want, you know, uh, fried chicken or they want, you know, uh, hamburgers. And I mean, I don't know, I've never been able to determine, you know, how much they eat of, of those things, but I, I can't imagine that <laughs> if I knew I, I was going to be executed, it, it, you know, in the evening, uh, that I'd really have an appetite, um, or, you know, I'm waiting on the Supreme court to delay my execution. I don't know that I could sit down and have a meal waiting to hear from the Supreme Court, whether they're going to stop the execution or not. But, um, you know, people uh, do strange things uh, on on the verge of of execution, including some of the things that they say, uh, which are uh, even more interesting at times. Yeah, I am interested in that they get so some people give final statements. Has there ever been a shocking one where someone confesses to a murder that they might not have ever said that they did or said something really mean to some of the victims families or anything like that well you know that's that's a good question um 
there certainly are, at least in, in the, in the executions that I, um, uh, wrote about, um, you know, there were still inmates who were defiant, uh, you know, that they were innocent and, and, you know, uh, you know, an innocent man is being, uh, executed tonight and, and things like that. Um, you know, there were people who said nothing, um, and that's probably the most common, um, you know, some of them were really strange. Uh, there was one guy, uh, Kel Colburn Brown, and he was, he was, um, from the state of Washington and he, uh, it was a terrible crime. You know, he, he, uh, dragged this woman off the street after she came out from work, um, you know, tied her up and sexually assaulted her over a period of time. Uh, then he threw her in this, in the trunk of his car and he was going to fly from the, uh, Washington, uh, the Seattle airport. And he put her in, she, he left her in the trunk and was going to leave the car there. And then he decided, well, you know, I probably shouldn't leave her in there because she's going to make noise. So he went back and stabbed her to death, uh, left her in the car, went to California, was going to do the same thing to another woman. And she was, uh, fortunate enough to escape from the bondage. He had her tied up as well. And, and he got caught. But the, the thing about him is he's on the gurney. Okay. He's about to get the lethal injection and he's complaining that he is about to die for one murder. Okay. When, um, what was the, the, the serial killer in Washington, um, who, who um, murdered, you know, I don't know how many women and, and they, he, they didn't give him the death penalty because he agreed to cooperate, uh, so that he could, uh, is that the green river murders or whatever? So he could, he would cooperate and tell them where other bodies were found or were left. So that he didn't get the death penalty. He said, I don't know how this is fair. He said, I only killed one person and he killed 50 and he, he didn't get the death penalty. So think about the logic of that. This guy's laying there saying, well, I only murdered one. Well, you know, that's enough to get the death penalty one. Um, and, um, is that a justification that, that the <laughs> yeah, other guy, exactly. did? <laughs> you know, so, so, you know, the, and my other favorite one, there was a guy in Arizona, uh, who was, who was getting executed. He was originally from Oklahoma, uh, Oklahoma and he's on the gurney and, you know, if you're a college football fan or not in Oklahoma, the football is king. And, and one of the sayings there is boomer sooner. That's, that's what they say at the football game. Boomer sooner. Boomer. So this guy's laying on the gurney and he said, you have anything you want to say? And he says, boomer sooner. So, so his last thought on this planet wasn't, oh, I feel bad. I'm sorry for what I did. I'm sorry for the pain I caused. His was to cheer on the University of Oklahoma's football team. Wow, that's interesting. You know, I, I think about this a lot, that people that do these super crazy crimes, like even the guy that you were talking about that was tying this woman up, sexually assaulting, ended up killing her. Like, there, I, I don't really think that most of these people are normal minded like you and I, and they just, they don't truly feel bad about it. They just, you know, so it would be shocking to me actually that a lot of people would say, oh, I feel bad for doing this because when you go that extra step to do stuff like that to a person, I just, I, I think you're like missing a chip, you know, <laughs> that, that mm -hmm. makes you have that kind of empathy for others and stuff like that. So I, I'm not shocked that you're saying that he was trying to cheer on a football team like right before he died, you know? Yeah. Well, you're, yeah. I mean, you're, you're, you're writing, you're, you're giving, you know, the classic, um, description uh, of a psychopath, you know, someone with, without empathy, uh, you know, someone who, uh, has no remorse, you know, and a lot of these people are, are those kind of people, you know, like we might step on an ant, they may, you know, strangle a woman to death. I mean, uh, <laughs> it, it's just, uh, you know, it's, it's a strange, uh, a strange kind of, and it's hard to even describe it's, it, it, it's sort of a, 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 a bizarre 
view of life and the value of life. But just as you're saying, like you step on an ant, right? You don't you don't go in the house and say and, and think about that all night. Like, oh, I really I feel bad. I shouldn't have did that. Like you're it, you don't care. Right. It's it's the same thing. But you're talking about another human. That's that's the level of, you know, sympathy that they have right. in those cases. Yeah. All right. Let's talk about. So you have a syndicated column on crime and punishment where I know you said that you had this this blog that was mattmangino.com and you work on that all the time, but this is, this syndicated column is something different, right? Yeah. Yeah, it is. It's, um, something that I, I really enjoy and I've had a lot of fun with it. Uh, and, it, and it's distributed by creators, uh, syndicate. And, and so I write a weekly column, uh, column, uh, on crime and punishment or, you know, crime and, and conduct is actually the name of the call of the column. And, and so, you know, it's distributed to, um, you know, newspapers around the country. Newspapers can pick it up, um, you know, regularly, regularly, or, you know, every so often. So it, it's just fun. I, I like to do it. I, I had, I, I did for about three years, uh, right, uh, for, uh, gatehouse, uh, syndicate and then they were ultimately bought out so i spent about a year or more without writing a column but but it's something i i, I really enjoy doing uh and, and i get to talk about a lot of different things what are the some of the more recent topics that you've covered in this column well um you know unfortunately there are so many things uh to write about uh right now you know with you know what's going on uh, with the, the trials involving Donald Trump, uh, the Supreme court has made some really interesting decisions, uh, recently a column I, I wrote within the last couple of weeks is, uh, you may remember this Susan Smith case out oh, of yeah. South Carolina, which was really kind of one of those first, you know, media mob kind of cases that were, you know, covered daily and written about daily. And, uh, yeah, so this is the anniversary and she's up for parole, uh, and, and she has a parole hearing in November and she's continued Susan Smith to do, uh, bizarre things in, in prison, like, you know, have sex with guards and, uh, you know, have, uh, phone sex with people that she's trying to get money from when she, she gets out of prison. So I, I don't, uh. And that's something, you know, I spent six years on the parole board in Pennsylvania. So I made thousands of dis decisions with regard to, uh, parole, uh, after I was, uh, the district attorney in Lawrence County and Susan Smith is not going to be getting out in November after her, uh, parole interview. Uh, at least that's what I think. Yeah. I, I hope not. I mean, <laughs> She she killed her children. It it was even just worse than that. The the lying about that, you know, saying that someone what carjacked her or something and took yeah. her car with her children in it and all that stuff. Yeah, if you remember, I mean, it was you know she she was in South Carolina and she said you know a black man uh, carjacked her, led her out, but took the car with the, the kids in it. Um, you know, so that you know, created a fear in, in, in South Carolina. And then ultimately, you know, she was exposed as, as a liar and, and ultimately was trying to get rid of her children because she was having an affair with a guy who didn't want to have children around. Yeah. And she's kind of, she's young, right? Isn't she like between 50 and 60? Yeah. Yeah. She's not, I mean, so I, I believe she was in her early twenties when, when that happened and that was, it was about 30 years ago. So yeah, she, she'd be in her fifties. Yeah. That's it. Well, I remember we were just talking about this on one of our news episodes a few weeks ago. I just can't believe that, that someone that kills both of their children in that way. I mean, being strapped into a car seat and drowning. Mm -hmm. I would just be allowed to get out and live another, you know, up to 40 years out of a life, having a whole new life, you know, it's just not. Right. Where can people yeah. get your book? So you can get my book 
it, it, a couple of different places. Um, so the, the publisher is McFarland and Company. So you could go on um, to McFarland and Company's website. Uh, it's also available, you know, at Barnes and Nobles and Amazon and all the all the places that you would typically uh, go online to to buy a book if you just um, you know put a Mangino or uh, the Executioner's Tool. And also, you can you could get it directly uh, from me a, again at mattmangino.com. Uh, you'd be able to get the book there as well. Awesome. Well, thanks so much for being here today. This was really, this taught us a lot about the death penalty and I'm glad we got to talk to you about it. Well, yeah, thanks for having me. I, I think it's just uh, great what you do uh, and, and uh, you know, for your listeners and, and viewers, it's just, um, it's so important um, to get these issues out and I think you do a tremendous job at it. And uh, it was an honor to be uh, on your program today. Thanks so much. I'll see you soon. All right. See ya. Thank you for listening to Mother Knows Death. As a reminder, my training is as a pathologist assistant. I have a master's level education and specialize in anatomy and pathology education. I am not a doctor and I have not diagnosed or treated anyone, dead or alive, without the assistance of a licensed medical doctor. This show, my website, and social media accounts are designed to educate and inform people based on my experience working in pathology so they can make healthier decisions regarding their life and well-being. Always remember that science is changing every day and the opinions expressed in this episode are based on my knowledge of those subjects at the time of publication. If you are having a medical problem, have a medical question, or are having a medical emergency, please contact your physician or visit an urgent care center, emergency room, or hospital. Please rate, review, and subscribe to Mother Knows Death on Apple, Spotify, YouTube, or anywhere you get podcasts. Thanks.